Hello. So in this lecture, we're going to be looking at different optimization methods that we can use to update our weights when we're doing backpropagation in neural networks. So each of these optimization methods is going to have its own pros and cons, and we will explore all of this. And hopefully by the end of the lecture, you'll have a better idea of how to select the right optimization method for the problem that you're solving. So having said that, let's actually get started. So the first method we're going to talk about is called stochastic gradient descent. And the idea here is that when we looked before at batch gradient descent, uh, the, what we're doing is that we're taking the whole training data and we're calculating gradients and we're updating our weight values using those gradients times a learning rate parameter. But stochastic gradient descent does things a little bit differently. So imagine we have a data set here. So we're given a data set. So what stochastic gradient descent says is that we should randomly sample. So technically it says we should randomly sample a single element from this data set, but here, let's just say randomly sample a mini batch, right? So we're going to randomly sample a mini batch, right? So using this mini batch that we sampled from our data set, so we're going to take this mini batch and we're going to calculate our error or our loss, which we talk about. So let's just know that by L, right? And on this mini batch, what we'll do is we'll compute the gradients DL with respect to whatever weight parameters we have, right? And then we'll make our update by saying our weight value WT is equals to the previous weight value minus alpha times the derivative, the partial derivative of the weight that we're talking about here. So that is essentially in a nutshell what stochastic gradient descent is. So the key takeaway is that, as you can see, this is very similar to what we're doing when we're talking about gradient descent, but here we are actually randomly sampling a mini batch. And the reason we would do that is that gradient descent is too time consuming because when we use the entire data set to make a single update, it will take much longer for us to actually reach our optimal point as opposed to sampling random mini batches uh, of our data set and computing gradients on these mini batches. So our hope here would be that, and the assumption that stochastic gradient descent would make is that this would average, these different random samples would average out to the true gradients the more mini batches we have. So as we train uh, for longer iterations eventually, like we would have not the, maybe not the correct optimal solution but uh, one that is we can work with uh, in different uh, practical situations we may have, right? So the advantage of stochastic gradient descent already is that it is a much faster algorithm than using batch gradient descent. And in practice, it's been shown to, uh, to at least work better than the aforementioned algorithm. So having said that, the next thing we're going to talk about is um, another algorithm whereby, okay, so let's start from here. So here in stochastic gradient descent, we introduced the idea of mini badges, and this is a powerful idea already uh, because it speeds up our learning process, right? But of course, this is not the only place we can improve. So one thing about this algorithm is that, let's say we have a data set here, right? We talked about our data set. We have x1, we have x2, we have x3, and so on, right? And each of these has their, let's say, corresponding weights, W1, W2, W3, uh, if it's, um, uh, sorry, W1 times X1 plus W2 times X2, right? Or so something like that. So the thing here is that when we're actually updating uh, each and every one of these uh, dimensions, for instance, X1, X2, and X3, they are actually not going to be the same. So we're using the same learning rate alpha, irregardless of whether we're updating weight one, weight two, or weight three, right? But 
this feature x1 might be sparse, this feature x2 might be dense, so it would be more appropriate to have different learning rates for the different weights, right? So here, whether we have w1 or w2 or w3, right, our weight values, we're using the same learning rate, right? We're using the same learning rate, but a more adaptive approach might actually have us use different learning rates for the different weight values because the, the, the corresponding dimensions here or the corresponding features are not going to be the same. Some of them are sparse, some of them are dense, right? So, for instance, if we have something like if our W1, for instance, is looking like this, right? So it's here. And our W2 right or whatever so the rate at which we learn these different functions we can adapt it based on the situation we have right so what we can do is that we introduce a new algorithm known as adagrad right so enter adagrad so which means adaptive gradient so what Adograd is saying is, why not give each weight a different learning rate, right? So give each weight a different learning rate, right? Because some of the features we have are going to be sparse, right? Sparse meaning maybe they're mostly zeros and a few ones in there or a few like non-zero entries rather. And some of them are going to be dense. Maybe there are no any zero entries. There are mostly not zero entries there. And so we should give them different rates of learning for good optimization. So how do we do that? So what Adagrad, it suggests modifying the learning rate in the following way. So let's say we have given WT, or like function here. So we say it's equal to WT minus one minus alpha, our learning rate, and then we divide this by the square root of the summation from i is equals to 1 until t of g squared plus a small epsilon, don't worry, I'll explain all of this in a moment, times the derivative of W t minus one, right? Where so this is gi. Gi is equal to dl over d. Let's say w t minus one. Okay. So this is essentially the update for undergrad. So okay, this is the computation. So what is it actually saying? It's saying that we should accumulate all the gradients that we have encountered before, right? And then we should essentially square them, right? Uh, take the square root of that. And then we are going to modify our learning rate by this. So if you see the only difference between uh, this update and this update is that we are actually dividing our learning rate by our squared gradients that have been accumulated. So let me actually explain this better. So let's say one dimension, let's say we have a problem like this. Okay. And then let's say we make an update like, like this. So one dimension is very large gradient updates, right? So what we're saying is that, okay, let's call this G1, uh, G2, G3, right? So what we do is, so this is the gradient, let's say at iteration one, at iteration two, at iteration three. So we modify our learning rate, right? Alpha to be alpha over 
uh, the square root of say g1 squared plus g2 squared plus g3 squared and so on right so as you can imagine as we move on and on alpha will be getting smaller and smaller because these gradients like will keep accumulating right so we started a, in our first iteration it will only be alpha over square root of g1 squared right in the next iteration it will be alpha over the square root of let's say g1 squared plus g2 squared right and the next iteration it will be like that so the advantage of this is that for instance if we are about to reach the minimum point right we actually want to slow down because if we're at this point we don't want to overshoot here right so having an adaptive learning rate like this whereby it gets smaller and smaller as uh, the learning rate gets smaller and smaller as we reach our minimum it actually might work best in our case right because it makes it easier for us not to have to fine-tune our learning rate as much because it eventually becomes smaller and smaller as we reach our minimum point so that is the advantage so this is the advantage when let's say we have like this very large gradients um, but imagine a case whereby we're dealing with sparse data sets right if we're dealing with sparse data sets that means our gradient will be much smaller and therefore our learning rate will be much larger Right. So if our if if our what you call it our gradient is smaller, that means the learning rate is larger because we're dividing by a smaller value here. And this means that undergrad would work well in envir environments where we have sparse gradients. Right. So we already identified two advantages. So works well when we have sparse gradients. Right, because if this if these are much smaller, uh, if these updates are much smaller, uh, then this learning rate will be much higher, and we can make like appropriate like jumps. Um, and the other advantage we talked about uh, was that we don't need to deal much with tuning our learning rates, right? But of course, as you can imagine, like, well, this is all an advantage. We are accumulating gradients from the start, right? We, and we keep adding them to this denominator. Eventually, our, eventually what's going to happen is that our learning rate is going to become much, much smaller and we will reach a point uh, whereby we are making very, very small updates anyway because our learning rate is essentially smaller because we're dividing it by the accumulation of the gradients, which only increase in time. So this value never gets smaller. It's always getting larger and larger and larger. And we use this epsilon here just to avoid a division by zero, so don't mind that. So the only thing you need to notice here, the only difference between what we're doing in stochastic gradient descent and what we're doing here is that we are adapting our learning rate by our, the total sum of our gradients right and the idea here is that we have a more adaptive gradient that we are computing now let's look at the problems with this approach right so imagine a problem like this so oh let me uh, open up a new page for this okay so imagine a problem like this so let's say we have a scenario like this where this is a local minimum and this is a global minimum or let's just say a better local minimum right so essentially if we're minimizing our error uh, being over here is much better than being up there. So we saw that, okay, if we're dealing with uh, convex problems like this, then undergrad works well. But the issue comes when we have uh, sort of a problem like this. Let's say this is how our loss function looks. And we want to get past, so this is known as a saddle point, 
right? So we want our optimization algorithm to be able to get past this saddle point, right? But with Adagrad, the, the limitations, as you might think, uh, is that as we are reaching our local minimum here, our learning rate becomes much, much smaller, right? So to be able to pass this point becomes much more difficult because at this point we'll be taking very, very small steps because of the accumulation of gradients, right? Uh, will be too high and our learning rate will be very, very small, like our adjusted learning rate will be very, very small. So we need an algorithm that is able to adapt to more non-convex functions like this. And these are more likely the, 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 the type of functions we'll be optimizing for anyway, because rarely do we have purely convex functions and so on. So um, this is one disadvantage of undergrad uh, in this sense. So having said that, let's actually go on to the next algorithm. And we'll come back to this undergrad method, uh, or at least like how it's inspired some other algorithms. But let's take, take, talk about uh, our prop, which means resilient backpropagation. So the idea here is behind this method is that we still want to adapt the learning rate for each weight, uh, but we're only going to use the sign of the gradient, right? So we don't care about uh, the magnitude. We only care if the gradient is positive or negative. So the idea is that we look at the last two gradients for our weight and two cases are possible right either they have the same sign or they have different signs okay so what we do is analyze last two gradients right so we we'll analyze let's say dw and dw of t minus one right let's say these are our last two gradients so what we do is say if dw times d w t minus one, right, is greater than zero, which means they're both positive. Then we're gonna take our learning rate and we're going to multiply it by some incremental factor, right? We will multiply it by some incremental factor, say, let's say by 1.5, so we accelerate the learning. Um, and I'll show why. Uh, otherwise, so else, so else if d w t this d w t times d w t minus one is less than zero, which means they're negative, then we try to decelerate the learning by dividing by some factor that's greater than one. Maybe we divide by two or something. So that's the idea here, and we update by saying wt is equal to wt minus s bar times alpha, where s bar is equals to the sine of dw. So the sine meaning, uh, sorry, the sine meaning whether it's negative or positive, right? Thing, dw sorry times or dwt minus one whatever in this case so if it's dwt so the idea here so let me explain this visually so let's say again we are given this functions and then we have this point right. So here our gradient is positive, and here our gradient again is positive, right? So since the gradients are both positive, what we do is we multiply this by an incremental factor. So in, we, we multiply this by incremental factor, our learning rate, our step size, so that we make a bigger jump, right? Because we're still, the gradient is actually positive. But if we're in a situation whereby, let's say, um, 
our gradient is positive here and let's say here it's negative which means that we overshoot right so here it's positive here it's negative this means that we actually overshoot and therefore we should decelerate our learning so what happens is here we should accelerate our learning and here we should decelerate okay so that's the idea behind this method called re uh, resilient backpropagation um, of course so this would not work well with mini batch updates uh, because it actually violates one of the assumptions we talk, uh, talked about when we talked about stochastic gradient descent, for instance. Uh, and it's actually ignoring the magnitude of the gradient. So let's say we have a bunch of batches and our updates were like minus 0 0.1, minus 0 0.1, minus 0 0.1, uh, minus 0 0.1, and say 0 0.4, right? So let's say these are our gradient updates. So normally we should think that, okay, if this is batch one, batch two, and so on, this should cancel out, right, these updates. But if we're using this method, the disadvantage is, let's say we're only looking at the signs. So we look, let's say the first time we look at this two, like this is a negative and this is a negative, right? And then, so we're gonna accelerate our learning, right? Because they're both negative. And then the next time this is negative and negative, we're gonna accelerate our learning even more. This is negative, so the first time it's like this, the next time it's like that. The next time this is also negative, we're gonna even accelerate our learning more. And this is negative and positive, right? So here we'll decelerate a bit, but the problem is we're not even considering the magnitude anymore, right? So that means if we're using this method, this, this, this are not going to cancel out, essentially. So a method that only relies on the sign of our gradients and not the actual magnitude uh, is, not, is not as effective, right? So that's why we probably do not want to use this method. Um, but having said that, uh, it, it's, it still helps us uh, at least learn some, like what's actually important when we're actually solving this optimization problem. So let's insert a new page here and talk about another algorithm known as RMS prop, right? Where the RMS just stands for root mean squared, right? So here, again, we're going back to the same idea about Edergrad, right? Because we're, we're, we're onto something here. Like the idea about Edergrad, again, what we had said was that we wanted to give each weight a different learning rate. Right, and we will normalize the step size or the learning rate by the accumulated gradient since the beginning. So what Adagrad says is that, uh, sorry, what RMS prop says is that, well, Adagrad had the right idea, just the wrong execution. Right. So use instead, let us use the moving average of the squared gradients to scale the learning rate of each parameter. So what it's saying essentially is we should make our update as follows. So it should be WT is equals to WT minus alpha over the square root of VT plus that same epsilon we had times DL uh, DWT where VT is equal to say some value rho times VT minus one plus one minus rho, say, uh, dl dwt, this squared, okay? So that's the idea here. Okay, so as you can see, this actually helps us to forget earlier partial derivative values and focus on most recently seen shapes of the search space. And why do we say that? Because one of the problems with Adagrad, as we saw, was that we're accumulating all of the gradients that we saw since the beginning, right? Because we're computing G1, G2, G3 squared, and so on. But what IMS prop allows us to do is instead 
we're going to decay, right, all the gradient. So for instance, the value of rho can take a value of say 0 0.9, right, which means uh, what we have is that when we reach a, um, a new gradient that we want to update, we're going to multiply it by 1 minus 0 0.9. That means at each step, we're only keeping 0 0.9 of what we learned before and just updating with 0 0.1 or 10% of what the new gradient is, right? So this allows us to decay, essentially, the old gradients, right? And just keep uh, the most recently seen shapes uh, of whatever our search space is, right? So it resolves the whole idea of, in undergrad, we said that we accumulate all of the gradients since the beginning, uh, or all of the squared gradients. Uh, but in this case, we are not doing that anymore uh, because we have a decaying parameter here, whereby uh, if we actually multiply like our, gra uh, our sin gradients right here by one minus rho, right? Then that means that uh, as we continuously update, we're going to forget everything that, not everything, but part of what we saw in the past. And we'll be mostly focusing on recently seen gradients. That's the idea behind this approach, right? So think of it as almost putting a, a window on our search space, right? Whereby we go like, okay, uh, the gradient that we saw far in the past, right? So let's say we have a shape like this or whatever. So the gradients that that we saw far in the past year, right? So there are gonna be numerous updates, right? So if we saw something far in the past, we don't wanna use this information. We want to forget, right, this information, right? Uh, because it is so far in the past and we want to use more like our recently seen parts of the search space, right? To update our gradients, right? So this decay parameter allows us to do that. That's what RMS prop actually is. So, so that's the idea. So this is an improvement on undergrad. And then there comes the idea of stochastic gradient descent with momentum, right? And the idea behind stochastic gradient descent of, with momentum is that we compute the moving average of the gradient, right? So we define it as mt is equals to. So there's a reason why I'm introducing uh, this different uh, algorithms right now, uh, because it's all going to sum up to one important algorithm that is mostly used. Um, and that will probably be, uh, you'll see from the, uh, in a moment. So let's say we have our beta here times mt minus 1 plus 1 minus beta times dl of say wt minus 1 right where and then we update our wt saying it's wt minus 1 minus alpha times mt right so this is essentially our stochastic gradient descent with momentum Right, and beta here controls the moving average. So the same way that uh, rho, what Rho was doing here, but beta here controls the moving average. So if beta is 0 0.9, what that means is that we are averaging over the last 10 iterations of the gradient, right? So if this is 0 0.9, we're just averaging over the last 10 iterations, and then we're trying to forget everything we saw before, right? And so the idea why this works well is because in, again, in stochastic gradient descent, we aren't actually computing exact derivatives. If you know, we're using mini batches, right? So we compute derivatives on a small batch, which means our derivatives are quite noisy, right? And they're not always moving in the correct direction, right? So we try to use this exponentially weighted averages of the gradient uh, so that we uh, this work better and they also return the most recent information we have about the gradient. So the reason why we've been introducing all of these approaches actually is to make it easier just to understand uh, 
the same method approach that we used when we're building our network in the like last lecture and that is the atom optimizer All right so the idea behind atom optimizer so again we saw that stochastic gradient descent with momentum um, is actually helping us uh, first of all retain the most uh, recent information like uh, we like we, we spoke before that if beta is 0 0.9 it means we're averaging over the last iterations 10 iterations of the gradient um, and we also introduced the idea behind RMS prop which is an improvement on undergrad where we said we want each learning rate uh, each weight to have a different learning rate, an adaptive learning rate. And we say the other grade are the problems whereby eventually, uh, as we sum up all the gradients in the beginning, the denominator, uh, the, the step size will become too small or the adaptive step size. And then we said, okay, let us use this uh, weighted average instead of our accumulated gradients, and that should work better. So what the Adam uh, optimizer does is it combines both stochastic gradient descent with momentum and the RMS prop, right? So it just says do whatever RMS prop is doing, add momentum, and uh, of course that's also talking about the cumulative uh, history of our gradients as well. And if we do that, then we'll have a much better algorithm uh, for what we do. So the idea now in Adam Optimizer is saying WT plus one, let's say, is equals to WT minus alpha over, as you can see, this is pretty much the same as VT plus epsilon times MT, right? So this is the update rule for or Adam optimizer. So what similarities do we see? So here the square root of Vt plus E, this is very similar to what we saw in RMS prop. But in this one, we were multiplying this eventually by uh, our gradient dl dwt, right? Uh, in stochastic gradient descent, when we're making our update, we're multiplying our learning rate by the momentum, right, our mt. But here, we're combining both methods. So this, we're doing this as in, this is what, uh, sorry, not that I got, but rather RMS prop was doing. And then this is what SGD with momentum is doing, right? So the first thing we realize is we're calling this V cap and M cap. But first thing, let's just write what we expect MT and VT to be. So essentially, MT is equal to what we had before. Let's say beta 1 times MT minus 1 plus 1 minus beta 1 times DL DWT. As you can see, this rule is the same as what we have with stochastic gradient with momentum here. So that's the rule we're using here for our dumb optimizer. So that's number one. And the second one we're using is Vt, right, is equals to B1 times Vt minus 1 plus, uh, let's say B2, no, not B1, 1 minus beta 2 times dl dwt squared. This, as you can see, is the same as what we had in RMS prop, right, which was just an improvement of our undergrad. So as you can see, all of these optimizers are inspiring each other and just trying to make improvements of one, one another and so on. So this is what we have, but this is just MT and VT, but here in this we have M cap T and V cap T. So how we would do that is just say, m cap t is equals to mt over 1 minus beta 1 t and v cap t is equals to v t over 1 minus beta 2 
t, right? So the only thing you need to focus on here when we're looking at these terms, like uh, this, this is just a, to just correct the bias uh, that comes from sampling this, like uh, in mini batches. That, that's what this uh, terms are essentially doing. But j what you really need to capture here is how just the RDM optimizer is being inspired by what RMS prop is doing and what stochastic gradient descent with momentum is doing, right? So basically saying, do not just adapt the learning rate based on the first moment, like what RMS prop does, but also the second moment of the gradients, right? So not just by the mean, but by also the uncentered variance, right? That's what this is doing. So um, yeah, so this basically covers uh, most of the optimizers that we would typically use. Of course, they're way more than that, and they're actually more that they're still being researched at this point. Um, but for this lecture, I hope uh, it will, at, at the very least, give you an idea of how we use these different optimizers when we're dealing with different problems. So yeah, thank you for your time and see you in the next lecture.